Terry Barber is a best-selling author and founder of Lighthouse Catholic Media. Jesse Romero is a retired law enforcement officer, a former kickboxing champion with a master's degree in theology. And together, they share a passion for evangelization and PhDs in common sense. You're listening to The Terry and Jesse Show on Immaculate Heart Radio. To join the show, call 888-526-2151. Here's Terry and Jesse. We're not right versus left. We're right versus wrong. And guess what? Truth has no color. Hey, some of you are driving out there. Keep uh, keep your both hands on the wheel and keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. The author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And for those of you that are sitting down getting ready for dinner, pull up a chair, pour yourself something to drink. Let's have a conversation. Ready for some soul food. I am. Amen. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 33. That's today's holy gospel. And really our Lord is what he's telling us is we got to count the cost of discipleship, which basically means that we've got to, we've got to set, we've got to set out our work for the Lord as we fight against the devil. We've got to calculate our forces. Here's what Jesus says. Great crowds were traveling with the Lord and he turned and addressed them. If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Let me stop there. You're saying, what? Jesus just says we got to hate. The term hate is a Hebrew idiomatic expression, which simply means to love less. That's what it means in Hebrew, okay? And what Jesus is saying here is that not even the sacredness of family loyalty should outweigh our commitment to Christ, since we must be willing to abandon even close relationships to follow Jesus. Hey, remember what St. Peter says in Acts 5.29? I'd rather obey God rather than men. So Jesus is calling us to detach ourselves from this world little by little. And I know it's hard. I get it. Followers of Jesus, we got to be ready to give up everything, family, family ties, Whatever Jesus requires in the service of being one of his disciples. So the Bible says, verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Whoa, what can I say? Hey, no pay, no gain. No Calvary, no Easter. Hey, Jesus suffered as Father Stan Fortuna says, everybody's got to suffer. You and me got to suffer. Okay? When we suffer and we unite our sufferings to Christ, what do we do? Make reparation for our sins. We assist other people in the body of Christ through our redemptive suffering to get out of purgatory. As Fulton Sheen says, you know what? Let's learn to drink death like water. The Bible says, which of you wishing to construct the tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there's enough for its completion? What I got to say there, Jesus is saying that discipleship is a serious commitment. It's not about testing the waters or holding ourselves back from God. Discipleship is about com- complete construction, complete surrender to Christ. And then the Bible ends, Jesus says, Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, the onlookers should laugh at him and say, This one began to build but did not have the resources to finish. Or what king marching into battle would not first sit down and decide whether the 10,000 troops he can successfully oppose, another king advancing upon him with 20,000 troops. But if not, while he's, while he's still far away, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms in the same way every one of you does, who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciples. So Jesus is comparing following him to the planning and determination to finish a construction project or the planning and strategy needed to wage and win a war against the enemy. Guess what? we got a plan to do what's proper in order to follow Jesus. And we have to have the proper resources and the disposition of our heart to successfully say, yes, Lord, I will follow you. A big amen. And if you're saying, who is this guy, Jesse Romero? You're on the East Coast. You're in the Midwest. Well, Jesse Romero is a full-time evangelist, okay? He's a former cop. And my name's Terry Barber. I'm the founder of Lighthouse Catholic Media, St. Joseph Communications, and Catholic Resource Center. I used to be a professional umpire, so we both see things in black and white. He's got the black and white policeman, right? I am the umpire who calls the balls and the strikes, calls people out and safe. 
And so we're here with you, and we want to thank you for letting us come into your home or your car. The reading that Jesse just gave, his, we call it an exegesis. In other words, he explains it. Some people say, well, man, he sounds like a Protestant. Well, the only reason he sounds like a Protestant is because we're excited about the Catholic faith, and we want to get more Catholics on fire about Jesus. And so I'm going to follow up with what Jesse said in the Scriptures with Sheen's quote of the day. If one loves, everything is easy. If one doesn't, everything is hard. Okay? Full sheen ahead. And this is what we do every single day. We'd love to have you tell your friends about us. If you have questions or comments, you can go to our show page, Terry and Jesse at Relevant Radio. We do this every single day, Monday through Friday. And if you're saying to yourself, I don't know, I, I'll just guarantee you this. If you're driving home from work, I guarantee you, you will not fall asleep because this is high energy Catholic radio on Relevant Radio. Yep, and, and we got we don't got we don't have low stamina here, okay? Nope. We got some nope. pretty we got some pretty high stamina. And if you suffer from low T, listen to this program, we can fix that problem. <laughs> some people think that Christianity is dying, but yep. Christianity isn't dying. You know what's happening? It's is shifting dramatically. Oh yeah. You know, uh, Christianity may be in decline in the US as more people, especially amongst the young people, they claim to be nuns. N-O-N-E-S. People who claim no religious affiliation when they're asked by religious pundits. But when you look at the facts, the center of Christianity is basically shifting from Europe to the global south. In other words, the religious landscape is particularly changing for the world's Christians, both Catholics and Protestants. A century ago, 80% of Christians lived in North America and Europe. Today, guess what? 40% of Christians live in North America and Europe. Wow. And, and in 1980, more Christians were found in the global south than the north for the first time in a thousand years. Today, here's where Christianity is moving in record numbers. It's moving in Latin America and Africa. Both those continents alone account for one billion Christians. In it's fact... Unbelievable. Christians grew from less than 10% of Africa's population to its nearly 500 million today. One out of four Christians in the world lives in Africa. And it's supposedly it's going to grow another 40% by 2030. Terry? And, he, and here's the, the religious wild card. It's China. Even today, demographics estimate that more Christian believers are found worshiping in China on any given Sunday than in the United States. What? Future trends, while difficult to predict because so much is below the religious radar, could dramatically drive down the world's religious nuns. You know, I'm just going to make it. It's not a political correct statement, but there were some bishops in, in uh, Germany who were criticizing the bishops and the people in Africa. And I just find it interesting that they're criticizing the church that's growing where their church in Europe, especially in Germany, they're all dying. So I just want to say kudos to the church in Africa because, let's face it, they're growing like a weed. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Are you ready for this, everybody? For every one person that comes into the church in America, seven people are leaving. Yeah, 13% of Americans identify as former Catholics for every one convert to the Catholic faith. See, that's brutal. Only 24% of the people are even showing up for Sunday Mass. You know, Bishop Robert Barron said it's it's a tragedy. This is, should be our number one attack right now to bring people back to the church. And we're going to be talking more about that. But these demographics are all on our show page if you go to Terry and Jesse at RelevantRadio.com. I can tell you why there's been a decline in the West and sure. general Europe and America. I'll tell you why. Yeah. Sure. It's pretty simple. Yep. Because of modernism and because of what's called the demythologizing of Scripture. In fact, Dr. Scott Hahn wrote an entire book on that about the politis, polit, let me say it right, politicization of the Holy yep. Bible. He wrote an yep. entire book on that. The way basically modernists have, starting in Germany and starting with uh, modernist Scripture scholars, They've basically stripped the Bible from all the, all the miracles. So in, in Europe and in the U.S., in these sophisticated societies, uh, all the, the, the miracles are explained away. Guess what? You go to Africa, Latin America, the Philippines, 
You go to China and you try to tell those Catholics over there that these miracles didn't happen, they're going to run you right out of the church. They're going to run you right out of the diocese. These people over there, number one, they haven't been poisoned with the cesspool of modernism, and they have a pure, pious Catholic faith. They know Jesus is God, and they know Jesus performs miracles and exorcisms, and they know Jesus gives that power to his church. And what that's why those churches are growing, because they actually believe what the Bible says. They believe in miracles. They believe that Jesus heals. They believe that Jesus Christ sets people free from demons. Guess what? In Europe and in the United States, not so much. Terry? Jesse, I wish you'd really tell me what you think and stop beating around the bush. Gosh, come on. All right, when we come back to this next break, I mean, we all know it. Have you noticed out in the back of church every Sunday, very few dads there? I have. We're going to have a special guest to talk about how to bring dad back to church and be fervent in the faith. Our friend is Doug Berry, who's been with us. We've been friends for over 25 years. And when he comes to our show in a minute, when we come back, up next, he's going to be Doug Berry, how he's been going around the country, firing up men. And that's why we love the guy, because he's right on the same page. He's got zeal for the faith, and he's got information that you're going to want to know about, because if you have a husband who's not practicing the faith, you're going to want to hear what he has to say, because... I've seen him in action. This man is the real deal. And what he's going to tell you is giving you uh, ideas of how to bring your husband more fervent in the faith. It's going to help the entire family. More in a moment. This is the Terry and Jesse Show on Relevant Radio. Catholic Radio. This is the Lord's Gym. We are your spiritual fitness trainers. Hey, Dad, did you know? Let me give you a statistic yeah, that I'm getting from a uh, from Germany here, from a, from Switzerland. It's a statistic that was given about five years ago. Here it is: If a father does not go to church, no matter how faithful his wife's devotions. Only one child in 50, that's 2%, will become a regular church goer. If a father does go regularly to church, regardless of the practice of the mother, between 66 to 75% of their children will become regular church goers. Guess what, Dad? Wow. The, the fact is, going to your kids going to Mass and church and getting to heaven is squarely on your shoulders. We got a buddy, third uh, a third guy in, in the the, the yep. three amigos here. Yep. Uh, we think exactly the same, and we want to talk. His name's Doug Berry from Battle Ready. Radix has been on uh, EWTN with his own program. And we want to talk about bringing men back to the church. That's where Doug's heart's at. That's where my heart's at, Terry's heart's at. Doug, Amen. welcome to the Terry and Jesse Show. And tell us, let's get right into it. Uh, what are you doing with Battle Ready to try to get men back into Holy Mother Church? You know, I tell you, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is men have to understand the purpose. Men have to understand the mission behind this. One of the greatest tragedies that's taken place with the faith over the last several decades has been this, this emasculation, this feminization, this watering down of the faith, this lowering of the bar. Our music, um, you know, uh, that, that takes place at many of our masses that we celebrate these days. Um, a lot of the devotions, a lot of the the, uh, the way we deliver the message uh, has become very, very soft. Men are not created for that. Now, there's a gentle side of this. There's no question about that. The gentleness of St. Joseph, for example, holding baby Jesus. But, boy, when push came to shove and things got tough, you know, Joseph's going to hand our, our, our blessed Lord off to our blessed mother, and he's going to get into the thick of it and do what he has to do the hard work, the Amen. tough job, the mission aspect of it. You want to bring men back to the church, we men have to understand that, number one, it's a fight for souls, and that fight is, is against an eternal enemy, an enemy that doesn't die, that doesn't sleep, that doesn't eat. But on the natural level, too, we men need to realize that we need to be prepared to handle whatever's happening around us on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, and look, look what's going on right now, for example, with the shootings in the churches and, and the shooting at Walmart and, and, and Colorado and, and Las Vegas and this unbelievable destruction that's spiraling out of control. And, and so many men 
can look at this and say, my first primary job is to make sure that my children, my wife are cared for, protected. This isn't just about your 401k and making sure that you got a, a nice, a nice house to live in and a good car to drive. That, that has its yeah. place, but my job is to make sure. And Jesse, you know this being a former, former police officer. We got to make sure. sure that if somebody breaks in the house, we're ready to deal with the bad guy. If there's a fire, we're willing to go through a wall to get our family out. Well, if there's a spiritual attack, we're willing to go to the ends of the earth to fight the spiritual enemy. We have to understand the mission aspect, the masculine mission aspect of our faith. We're not delivering that message overall in the church nearly as effective enough. I had a priest say to me one time, I'm tired of hearing the Catholic message being delivered to men like a baby shower or a wedding, uh, a wedding shower. This is different than men. You know, Doug, Doug let, me, let me jump in, brother. Uh, God bless you for that. Uh, this bat, battle ready. I know that you have a website and I've been on it to get people to get ready spiritually for spiritual warfare. And I want to ask you, can you give your website out and and let people know how they can actually have you come to their parish to fire up the troops? Are you still doing that, brother? Oh, yeah, you bet. BattleReadyStrong.com. Okay. Okay. BattleReadyStrong.com. And I thought I was just out. I was out in uh, I was in Vancouver, Washington for about eight days, just about a week and a half ago. Good. You know, did a whole tour down there. You know, I, I was in Wisconsin before that. I've been in Florida, Texas, all over the country. Ah. And, yeah, if anybody okay. wants to, to want set something up in their parish to do a Battle Ready rally to talk about spiritual warfare and being physically and spiritually prepared for everything that's happening in our world right now. Then, yeah, give, give me a call. Contact me through the website, BattleRayStrong.com. You, you know, I'll come out to the parish. And the talks are for men and women alike. You know, in fact, right Good. now, and Jess, I know you'll, you'll appreciate this. I'm doing a lot more with regards to even teaching just basic self-defense, basic protection in a church. Okay? We have to understand. We've got to be prepared, whether we're walking <laughs> through a shopping mall, whether we're at church, whether, we're, whether it's spiritual battle or physical battle. We must understand this is a mission and lives are at stake spiritually and physically. And we men are the first line of defense. And we need to get off hey, the easy backside. Hey, Doug, Doug, let me jump in there. I can appreciate what you're doing. I'll tell you why. I know some people may criticize maybe our style and our and our approach to Catholicism. <laughs> I, I've actually heard some people say that, you know what, uh, anybody who learns self-defense or maybe, you know, exercises their Second Amendment or stuff, you don't trust in God. You guys, uh, you guys just have to, you, you, don't, you don't have enough faith. You don't trust in the Lord. Well, I would just say this. That St. John Paul II has taught us that Catholicism is both faith and reason. And uh, we can just go back to, let's just say, little boy David. Can you imagine when he saw Goliath cussing out the Israelites and cussing out God 40 days in a row? Do you think little David would have been, it would have been sufficient for him just to say, I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to pray that Yahweh will squash Goliath? No. Yahweh was waiting for somebody to stand up and use their physical capabilities and prayer and faith to go and confront Goliath. So again, David didn't go hide away in a little cave and just say, I'm going to pray so he'll stop saying bad words to us. No, David picked up <laughs> a slingshot and sa and prayed to God and then said, Goliath, guess what? With, with, me and, with God on my side, we're an army of one. I think that's your approach, Doug. I think that's what you're trying to tell people is Catholicism isn't just, you know, let's go hide in a cave and just be pious all day. We have to also engage the world, uh, you know, and, and we're body, soul, composite. So that means we have to engage the world with our words and even uh, with our presence. Doug, any comments? Yeah, oh, absolutely right. And in fact, you know, let's 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 really help people realize that whether it was that story, and you're absolutely right on that, is that, that David was so upset. I mean, he even cries out, "You will not do this to the to the God of Israel. You will not do this." And he steps up and goes into battle. You know, back, go to the go to uh, Joseph in the Old Testament when Joseph says, "There's going to be seven years of famine after seven years of plenty." So what do you do in the seven years? Store up food. There's a physical, natural engagement that, that he told the people needed to be done in order to survive the seven years of famine. Fast forward down to the time of Joan of Arc, when the bishop said to Joan of Arc, will God not give us victory? And she says, yes. When the men take up arms and go into battle, 
That's when God will give us victory. Go to 1565, the siege of Malta, when Grandmaster John Lavalette led 800 Maltese knights, 500 a uh, militia made up of Spanish and Maltese against 50,000 Muslim Turks and preserved racism for that time period because he defended Malta in battle. But these were warrior monks. These were knights who consecrated their lives to our Blessed Mother. They gave their lives to the church, and they trained to, for battle. Go to the Battle of the Ponto, 1571, when Pope St. Pius V <laughs> said, I want an army. Mm -hmm. I need an army, Don Juan of Austria. But they must pray the rosary. They must make sure that they're not blaspheming or profaning. They must make sure they're on their knees, devoted to Mary, devoted to the Lord, and they won the battle. But they had to engage in the physical. So whether it's storing up food for famine, whether it's engaging in the physical aspect of, of warfare, there is a time and a place where God calls us to be spiritual and physical. David did not just physically take on Goliath thinking, I can do this on my own. He didn't just sit back, like you said, Jess, and ran into a cave to pray. He took prayer and action, and he moved forward with the mission. And because of that, he became the only one, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Scripture says, is a man after God's own heart. How in the world right. can anybody say yeah. that God does not want us to be physically engaging in what's happening in our world today? Here's one more for our, for our Protestants, uh, brothers that are listening to this we got program. Two minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, Moses, yeah. Moses did the same thing. Moses saw a uh, an Egyptian guard giving a Jewish slave a beat down. And yep. I, Moses could have just ran to, to a cave and says, I'm going to pray to Yahweh so that Egyptian guard stops beating that Hebrew slave. No, he didn't. He, I'm sure he prayed, but he got busy, rolled up the sleeves, and he put that guy in a rear naked choke, and he took action. So we see in the lives of the saints, faith and reason, and I appreciate your message, Doug Terry. Doug, I've got a minute left, but I want to mention the catechism talks about proportionate measures when we do defend our family, and we're actually obligated to do that. One last time, Doug, how can people contact you for you to come to their parish or to their event? Yeah, that's right. And by the way, people, that's paragraph 2264 and 2265. St. Thomas right. Aquinas emphasized the importance of appropriate measure, but even to the point of legitimate self-defense, meaning even taking that's lethal right. action, if at all, uh, all else fails. So, yes, it is in the teachings of the church. Sure. My website, right. battlereadystrong.com, battlereadystrong.com. I'd love to come to people's parishes, uh, families, okay. organizations, conferences, and try to fire up the troops to be ready spiritually and physically for the battle. Doug Berry, thanks again for joining us here at the Terry and Jesse Show. Up next, we're going to talk more about manliness. You won't want to miss it here at the Terry and Jesse Show. For today's giveaway, call 877-526-2151. Catholic and proud of it. It's the Terry and Jesse Show on Relevant Radio. Blue Collar Catholic Radio. Sit back, pull up a chair. Grab your favorite drink. Let's keep it sober. We'll turn your frown upside down. The new Catholic manliness, that's a term that describes what is happening now in the Catholic Church. Hiller Belloc, one of the greatest Catholic historians, he said the following. The Catholic Church makes men of such she may also someday make soldiers. He said this about 60 or 70 years ago. Sunday, she may also make soldiers. You know, that's exactly what we're called to be. From children of God at baptism to soldiers of Christ at confirmation. But there's been an effeminization of our culture. And so look at what Todd Aglialoro writes in this, this paragraph about what a lot of Catholics experience. He says this. Consider a Sunday in the life of the typical American parish. Father Riley, once his mother's darling, says mass before a congregation disproportionately representative of widows, both the traditional and the football kind. Soccer moms flying solo and budding young liturgistas running the mass. At the elevation of the sacred hosts, extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist, 80% field, female, 20% male, and altar servettes gather around the sanctuary to lend immortal support. After Mass, 
Father Riley enjoys a donut in the church basement while regaling the ladies of the hospitality guild before heading back upstairs to sit in as a token male at the meeting of parish CCD leaders. And later that afternoon, Sister Dorothy fills him in on doing the things of confirmation class, Peace and Justice Committee, RCIA, and youth group. What's the point that Todd is making in this article? He's saying that basically we're having an overwhelming amount of females in the Catholic Church in parish life at mass and liturgy throughout the week. Where are the men? Okay, The church obviously is the body of Christ. It's for all of us. But this is why young boys, young men stay away from the church because they've told me. They say, Mr. Romero, that's what women do. It's a woman's endeavor. And so there's therein lies the problem. We want to give some solutions. I've got a couple of solutions. Terry, what do you think? I want to hear your solutions. But 40 years ago, we were have we were experiencing the same thing when I was a teenager and our local parish priest brought all the football players, the wrestlers, the baseball players uh, to be altar servers uh, at our parish. And he gave us something to do. OK. And these men that I still I know now they're in their 60s, late 50s. All of them are fervent Catholics today. But you know what? Those like I'll give you an example. But today, right now. Where are the men? You know what they say? Well, the women are doing it. I don't want to be, you know, I, I, I know this because I have sons, okay? They want to be men, okay? And St. Paul, I'll just say it real quick. He uses military language for us, right? We want to be soldiers for Christ? Are you kidding me? Uh, you really think a young man is going to get active in the church when there's 90% women that they're, they're mothering them? No, we don't want that. And I know this is going to make some people uncomfortable to say it, but I think we need to give men some area of space to be fervent in the faith and not just have the women doing things. I, I really think that we've we've made it so that they're not welcome. That's my take, and I think we need to solve that problem. If not, we're going to continue to have seven people leave the Catholic Church for every one that comes in because without dad, without these young men living their faith and being fired up on their faith, Guess what happens when they get married or if they don't get married? They're not going to be fervent. And guess what? They leave the church and they're not leading their family because they're not engaged in their Catholic faith. We need to get the man. Sorry, but that's my take. Here's uh, there's a book written by Leon Poodles. He's the author of a book called The Church Impotent. And basically what he says in the book that the church, the Catholic Church essentially has become a woman's club with some male officers. Think about that statement, okay? And what we've seen oftentimes is manly Catholicism has been repressed, stigmatized, covered up, or otherwise forgotten for lack of practice. And here's one of the things that we have to start changing because men, they, they have an, a, an automatic aversion to it. Well, you have to speak to men in a different way, in a different modality. For example, yeah. I can tell you this. Men struggle. I know I do. I struggle sure. with being called the bride of Christ. I know Jesus is God. Don't get me wrong. I get it. I know I'm a sinner. But that that phrase right there, it doesn't appeal to the average guy. Okay. Now, women love that. They got no problem with that because they were born to be brides. So oftentimes this changing our language makes men a lot more receptive. For example, one of the things that I, I do, and men love this, instead of using the bride of Christ, which is biblical, don't get me wrong, okay? I say, the church is our mother. Ah, see, that's also another metaphor in scripture. The church is mm -hmm. mater ecclesia, mother church. And so when you say this to a guy, now this gives them a reason to stand up and say, man, I got to stand up for something. And defend. I, I remember, I, I, I tell these guys all the time, don't you remember the movie Troy came out back in 2004? You have King Hector, okay? He's got 5,000 Trojan soldiers, and you got <laughs> 50,000 Greek soldiers that just landed on the beach, and they're being led by an undefeated warrior called, uh, he was called Troy. 
He was the leader, leader of, of, of the Greek soldiers. Prince Hector stood there. He's on number 10 to 1. Okay? And here's what he told his 5,000 Trojan soldiers to stand up to 50,000 undefeated Greeks. You know what he said? He said this. He didn't say, you are the bride of Troy. Okay? He said this. <laughs> he said, Trojans. All He had a sword up in the air. Trojans all my life. I've lived by a code. And the code is simple. Honor the gods, love your women, and defend your country. Troy is mother to us all. Fight for her. And you see 5,000 Trojans raise their sword up in the air. And they say, Ahua! Ahua! Well, guess what? You tell that to a Catholic guy, say, you know what? We got something better than Troy here. We got the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is our mother. Okay? This is what inflames a man's heart with courage and chivalry. When you tell him, we defend, we fight for Holy Mother Church. Okay? We are the church militant. And our duty is to love and adore God, to defend our women, and defend Holy Mother Church. See, when you talk like that to men, they you inflame their heart with faith. And it reminds me of St. Paul's language. Terry said it. Yep. Military language. That's right. St. Paul says, yep. fight the good fight. First Timothy 6, 12. St. Paul says in First Thessalonians 4, 16, he says, we fight yep. until we hear the shout of the archangel and the Ooh. trumpet of God. <laughs> Guys, let's change our language and let's quit talking to each other like effeminate men, like metrosexuals. Yeah, and you know, let's face it. Look at our culture. Look what's on television. Dad's always a knucklehead, right? He's the weak one. He doesn't know anything. See, we have to take the scripture and implement what God's word teaches about men and give men a challenge because men need it. They don't need to be told, sit in the back and let mom take care of it. Can you imagine what happens to a family? We talked about that earlier. When dad's not practicing the faith, mom's trying to do it all, right? And guess what? It can't be done without dad. That's how important dad is. So how do we get dad involved? I'm going to mention this. Jesse, I, we all go to men's conferences several times a year, and we speak at men's conferences. And I see that these men are just looking for leadership. They're looking for reasons to go back to church. And we tell them about Jesus in the Eucharist. We tell them about confession. We tell them to act like men and get down on your knees and pray. And we get the rosary out. We call, call you're going to be a mama's boy. Yeah, the blessed mother. See, we challenge them. They will respond. But today, unfortunately, many men are just sitting in the back and going, whatever, because nobody's challenged the men. And here at the Terry and Jesse show, we're going to do that every time. So, Mom, if your husband isn't practicing the faith, make sure he listens to the Terry and Jesse show. You know, I think I think our Protestant brothers for launching the men's movement, because let's be Amen. honest. I mean, uh, we, we in many places. We have a testosterone-free church, but thanks be to God that back in the early 1980s, it was the evangelical Protestants started a men's movement called the Promise Keepers, and it took the country by storm. And guess what? We as Catholics started saying, we've got to do the same thing. We've got to have our own men's rallies, and we started. Now, ours are not as big as the Promise Keepers were, but guess what? Our rallies have kept on going now since the 1980s, Promise keepers has stopped. The men's movement in the Protestant church denominations has basically stopped. Somebody ran out with the, the money from promise keepers. That's another story. <laughs> but the Catholic men, the Catholic men's movement, it's it's it's, it's consistently uh, trucking along from one diocese to another, getting thousand men here, five thousand men there, three thousand men there, and guess what? We're speaking to men in a way that appeals to them. They don't want to hear this, you know, Jesus loves you. Now let's go make a collage and, and, and blow up some balloons, <laughs> banners, and butterflies, okay? And they don't want to hear talks from anybody from the Lavender Mafia either. They want to hear talks from men that love God. And again, as, Amen. As, we, we, we're, we're not calling Catholics to be macho men. I reject that, okay? I'm, I'm Mexican-American. I reject machismo. So I'm going to tell you right now because those guys are monsters themselves. But I also, we have to reject the effeminate, metrosexual, Hollywood-type man. You know, the guy that wants to pluck his eyebrows every morning. Uh, 
and, and, and made sure that, uh, you know, he's wearing his, his skinny jeans. As Catholic men, you know how you prove your masculinity? You sacrifice yourself for those you love. You sacrifice your life for God. You sacrifice your life for Holy Mother Church. The church is our mother. And you sacrifice your life for your bride and your family. That's the definition of a real man. Amen to that. Hey, up next, what Planned Parenthood is telling blacks, you're going to be blown away by what they're doing. But it's consistent for 100 years. Don't turn that dial. We'll be right back. This is the Terry and Jesse Show on Relevant Radio. Man, the, guy, the guys in the studio are going to make me break dance over here. <laughs> you don't want to see a you don't want to see a fifty six year old guy break dance. Hey, you know what? <laughs> no fake news here. No cafeteria Catholicism. What are you going to get here? Full contact Catholicism. Hey, did you know that Planned Parenthood has has been telling blacks in this tweet? That you're better off aborting your babies. Is this microphone on? Are you kidding me? This has to be the most shameless marketing strategy in recent history. Did you know that Planned Parenthood, their Twitter account called PP Black Community, they tweeted a scary stat on Halloween morning. They said this, quote, if you're a black woman in America, it's statistically safer to have an abortion than to carry a pregnancy to term or give birth, close quote. You know what I say? What a racist insult. What a bull-faced lie. This tweet was cooked up in hell. Terry? Absolutely, but it's consistent with their founder, Margaret Sanger, a hundred years ago. The, you know, Jesse, we're not, I'm not surprised that they said this. They've been saying this for a hundred years. I would like to ask you to tell our listeners a little bit about the founder, of Planned Parenthood, and then you'll see why this statement that they just made on Halloween is consistent with what the founder said about abortion. The founder of Planned Parenthood, her name is Margaret Sanger. It used to be called the Birth Control League. Margaret mm -hmm. Sanger is a is a eugenicist. Now, Did eugenics, it? yep. it's probably a nice sounding word, but you know what it actually means, the actual definition of eugenics? <laughs> It means this. Check it out. The controlled and selective breeding of the human race. What? That's what it See means. See how consistent they are? See, by the beginning of the 20th century, when Darwin's theory was safely embraced by the scientific establishment, the theory of, theory of evolution, eugenics, that's when it was launched. Eugenics led directly to the birth control movement. And guess what? All the same players were involved, such as Margaret Sanger, who was the member of the American Eugenics Society and the editor of the Birth Control Review. Look at what she wrote in the Birth Control Review in an article. She said this, quote, more children for the fit. That means white people, okay, if you, if you want to know. Less children right. for the unfit. That means people of color. And she made it clear in this journal article whom she considered unfit. Who's the unfit people that shouldn't have kids? Here it is. Hebrews, Slavs, Catholics, and Negroes. That's according to her own journal article. So what does she do? She set up birth control clinics only in minority neighborhoods. And she openly advocated the idea that, that such people should apply. Guess what? She said that minorities should apply for official permission to have babies like immigrants have to apply for visas. Okay. Why don't we hear of this connection between Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, and eugenics? I'll tell you why. Two words, Adolf Hitler. Because Hitler instituted eugenics in Germany. He led an entire country in carrying out eugenics. Not only to breed what he believed to be a superior race, but to eliminate everybody else who he considered to be inferior. And you know something that sickens me? Did you know that in New York, in New York, there is a street called margaret sanger street okay i'm just wondering i mean Sick. mayor de blasio he's trying to get rid of uh you know he's trying to be very politically correct and get rid of all these statues well maybe he should get rid of that street called the margaret sanger street new york terry yeah you know I, I made a promise at the beginning of the show that you wouldn't fall asleep on your way home driving i i think i've kept that promise this is high energy <laughs> catholic radio i i want to mention that evangelist 
Avita King, director of the Civil Rights for Unborn Children. She's the niece of Martin Luther King, had something to say about Planned Parenthood black community message to the young women. I love what she said. She said, Mother Teresa, I'll say St. Mother Teresa, saw abortion as the greatest example of poverty. It's poverty, she said, to decide that a child must die so that you may live as you wish. Abortion is a civil wrong. The pro-life movement stands for justice. And in the new civil rights movement, what blacks were for the civil rights movement of the 1960s, the unborn are for the civil rights movement of today. Wow. Amen to that. She was not alone in her condemnation because Twitter's accounts blew up attacking, really, the Planned Parenthood statements. And I'm glad it is because, you know what, someone has to stand up for the unborn. And if you say, Terry and Jesse, you're always bad-mouthing Planned Parenthood. Well, let me tell you something. I'll tell it right now. Planned Parenthood CEO is the devil. And we're going to attack Planned Parenthood with the truth of Jesus Christ and for unborn babies every time they do something stupid like this. I can't believe that Planned Parenthood is actually trying to convince young black women that they shouldn't give birth. Okay? They're, they're telling Crazy. them that abortion is a safer option than giving birth. That's what they're saying in this Twitter, in this tweet that they put out. And, and they're saying that if, to black women, if you choose to be a mother, you'll most likely die. How do they know? Who died and made them God? You know? It, this they is, don't make money this, any other way. That's right. This is... Follow the money. Obvious. It's malicious. It's a hard sell to minorities, yep. neighborhoods, that they've invaded with their abortion clinics. Do you realize that most Planned Parenthood or family associate of abortion clinics are in minority neighborhoods? All you got to do is go look at their website. That's true. 80% that's of the fact. clinics are there. And what are they trying to do? You know, if you want to know how reputable this business is, all you have to do, look no further. Look at convicted murder and former abortionist Kermit Gosnell, the doctor in West Philadelphia. He, he's a classic example of unregulated abortion clinics in black neighborhoods. Okay. And the fact is, I'm so glad that Alveda King is being countercultural. And she's standing up and yep. being an authentic voice for young black women. Terry? Amen to that. And you know what? I use the analogy about pro-life. If you were a farmer and you were watering the cornfields and you had the, the beets over here and you had all your vegetables and the barn was on fire, would you take the hose and keep watering the garden? No. You'd put the fire out. The barn's on fire. Well, right now. Abortion is our number one issue because think about it. 4,000 babies every day are being snuffed out. And I can't be quiet before God. I have to speak up for those little children because if we don't, who will? And I want to ask you, those who are going to abortion clinics to pray, the very presence of you being there, 40 Days for Life and others, you stop abortions taking place because of your witness. And I would say now is the time to stand up for the unborn, by your lives, by your prayers, and by your actions. And I will say this, my final thought, and I'll turn it back to Jesse. I have been at clinics where I have seen women change their minds because of people standing out there praying, the power of prayer. I want to encourage you, if you've never done it, try it. Join 40 Days for Life. Join a pro-life group and pray that rosary outside a clinic. It'll change lives. That's right. We're called to be saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Get involved in 40 Days for Life. You know, Hitler, he's the one that implemented eugenics in the country of Germany. Yep. He wanted to breed a superior race, and he wanted to eliminate everybody else who was inferior. But did you know this? Where did Hitler find his early support for his eugenic ideas? You're probably wondering, man, who put that in Hitler's mind? Guess where he got it from? He yeah. got it from Margaret Sanger <laughs> and her circle of eugenic yep. scientists from Nazi Germany because the Nazi Germany scientists were writing articles for Margaret Sanger's birth control review periodical. And the members of Just Margaret facts, Sanger's folks. American Birth Control League, guess what? Mar Sanger's team, they went to visit Nazi Germany and they sat in on the sessions yep, of, the, of the Supreme Eugenics Court 
And guess what? They came back to America with glowing reports of how the sterilization law was, quote, here's Margaret Sanger's word, was weeding out the worst strains in the Germanic stock in a scientific and truly humanitarian way. Wow. Lord, help us. Terry. Amen. Let's pray for the conversion of our country. Gosh, and don't forget to pray for the poor souls in purgatory. This is November. When we come back tomorrow, we're going to have another high-energy Catholic show for you. Tell your friends to join the Terry and Jesse show, especially your, your husbands. May God richly bless you and your family. For today's giveaway, call 877-526-2151. 